schedule, we have we have one hour and a half discussion. To uh, so, welcome to everybody. Good morning to everybody. Uh, let me first briefly introduce myself. I am Pier Giuseppe Fortunato, and I work for the development, uh, uh, the globalization and development strategy division here at Ancted, and I'm running this uh, webinar together with my colleague and friend Annalisa Pribi from the OECD Development Center. And it's really a pleasure to uh, participate to this kind of event. As you know, this is an event held in the running up to our ministerial that will be will take place virtually next uh, next early next month in Barbados and is a webinar on a topic very delicate one the global value chains and it's not only in the running up of our ministerial but we are also the WTO meeting coming up the COP in Glasgow uh, all uh, events in which the discussion on global value chains and the policy framework to make these global value chains really work for development I think it will feature will feature highly. I will try to be very brief because I would like to leave as much as possible time and space to our uh, prominent panelists, which comes brought from the academia and uh, from uh, practitioners and policymakers uh, on a topic that, as I was saying, is crucial today and was crucial before the pandemic hit the global economy is becoming even more important today. Um, because, in a sense, certain fragilities, which is already there, which were already characterizing. Uh, global value chain and international production networks somehow have been exposed and amplified by, by the pandemic. There is huge uncertainty uh, which undermines firms' production because the pandemic, as we know, is shifting back and forth from one region to another, and this creates problems in terms of decision of production to the firms. As we have been witnessing, there have been surge of demands on critical goods, like, for example, masks and ventilators, which have gone unmet because it's difficult for the firm to increase suddenly their production and to get back to normal level of production when the spike of demand gets back. And probably even more important, these certain important trends, and we will discuss these today, which are already evident before the pandemic, like for example, reshoring and automation have been somehow accelerating or run the risk of being accelerated by the pandemic, because for example, as in the case of reshoring, these allow firms to be a bit more flexible in uh, managing their production and therefore to face a lower risk and to reduce the cost associated to a risk in the case of shocks like the one of the pandemic. And uh, from a more, in a sense, geopolitical point of view, all of these, the disruption of, the, of, of value chains, the disruption of travels, of course, can undermine political effort on economic and political integration and push, in a sense, the country towards a more self-sufficient uh, model. I've been working on analysis a bit in the aftermath of the pandemic on this, but the, the enormous rise of export bans that we witnessed in the spring of 2020 is in a sense a, um, an evidence and an example of this. And as I was saying, ANTA together with OECD Development Center, together with UNIDO, together with our uh, say traditional partner, we have been working uh, on these topics before the pandemic. We have been keeping working uh, during the pandemic. I hope we will keep doing this uh, after the pandemic, uh, as soon as possible, in, in this sense. And we've been doing so very closely, working very closely to countries, not least in the framework of the OECD policy initiative on global value chains, transformation and development, which is uh, led actually by Annalisa, and which count on the participation of different partners, but one of these critical partners is UNIDO, which is today represented by uh, my friend and Dan uh, Seric. So without further ado, it is precisely to Annalisa that I'm happy to leave the screen to introduce the panel and share and drive us through this to this webinar, Annalisa. Thank you, thank you, Giuseppe. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's it's a real pleasure to to be with you today. And um, as as Pepe mentioned, uh, we for us is very important to keep this dialogue uh, continuing. We were working all together with Pier Giuseppe Anted and with Tonido Adnan and other colleagues and uh, also with, uh, with the other panelists of today, really in trying to understand how can global value chains support development and when they can do it and what are the conditions under, under which maybe they challenge development and what we can do through policies to make it work better for developing countries. Today we have a stellar panel 
And we have actually uh, four very dear friends uh, around the table that I wish we were all together. Uh, I miss seeing you guys. So let me introduce first and then I will start asking some, some questions. Uh, we have Adam Anteric, who is research manager at the uh, Department of Policy Research and Statistics at UNIDO and a well-known expert on, uh, on GVCs and industrial development. We have Professor uh, Fiona Trojina, uh, South African Research Research Chair in Industrial Development at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa, and broad expertise uh, um, on development and industrialization. Uh, we have the Executive Director of INDEF from Indonesia, so bringing a little bit more us into the practice of designing and implementing policies. We have Saweed Ahmad, welcome with us. And Professor Francesco Prota, Professor of Economics at the University of Bari, Italy, who has been following FDI development and industrialization in developing countries and with a special, let's say, heart devoted to Africa uh, in, uh, throughout uh, all his career. So uh, I think we have uh, we have really uh, a great group to to start to start our day and uh, our our seminar. Let me let me start maybe by asking Adnan. You know, uh, we you have been working and we actually have been working together in discussing. Uh, how value chains were changing. And prior to the outbreak of the pandemic, we were looking at digitalization, the demands coming from increased need of transparency, sustainability, uh, the need for value chains to perform in a way that respects uh, developing countries' visions and needs. Uh, the pandemic has somehow accelerated some of these changes, but as Pepe was mentioning, we have also seen that trade has actually not performed as we were thinking. Uh, we were not ready, I think, to see trade altered so much as, as it was. Um, in, the, in the efforts of building uh, forward better, which is something that uh, most countries around the world are doing, uh, there are new policies implemented. What do you see or what do you think are the key new trends in, that will shape the organizations of value chain? If, if, you, if you could pinpoint to some of the big changes that you see when we look forward. Thank you, Adnan. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, Annalisa, and also big thanks for, to uh, Pier Giuseppe for inviting me uh, <clears throat> to speak at this important event today. Um, yeah, as has been said, I mean, this is a topic very close also to UNIDO's heart and uh, mandate. Uh, and we have been looking into this issue, um, well, way before the pandemic, in fact, started on the future of GVCs and in which direction they need going. And um, <clears throat> this is also a topic, in fact, that is uh, at the core of our ongoing work in the context of the Industrial Development Report 2022 which is looking at the future of industrialization in a post-pandemic world. And uh, one of the chapters, in fact, which I've been co-leading <clears throat> asked that question on uh, COVID-19 and the future of uh, GVCs. And the, the basic question that we asked uh, at, the, at the beginning of that research process was whether COVID-19 is a game changer for GVCs. Uh, and very quickly on in the process, we uh, arrived at the, <clears throat> at the conclusion that is, uh, too early for an evidence-based answer uh, to this question. I think this is a question that will be um, um, uh, asked by the economics profession uh, over the next decade uh, or analyzed over the next decade. But what we can, of course, see in the, in the short run uh, trade data in particular is that uh, our initial prediction of, of a V-shaped recovery in most industries is in fact uh, <clears throat> confirmed and therefore we do not necessarily um, see or predict a lasting impact of the pandemic induced disruption on the overall structure of GVC. So in, in other words, it's not, it is not the pandemic itself in a way that will be triggering uh, the structure. And then I think also, Importantly, when you speak to, to, to globally integrated businesses, so MEs in particular, they in fact confirm that as well. Uh, disruptions uh, along the global supply chain are uh, very common. Um, if you think about you know, uh, higher force events um, like the pandemic or extreme weather, if you think about you know, geopolitics or policy-induced changes, trade wars, et cetera, or even idiosyncratic events, if you think about 
major suppliers going bankrupt, etc. So these are all very common phenomena that um, globally integrated enterprises are experiencing on average uh, every one to two years. Uh, we have disruptions of you know one to two weeks or one to two months or every four years, um, which um, means in fact that they are um, you know they, they can anticipate they are fairly well prepared to, to weather disruptions. But I think what the past decade has shown is that we have witnessed this agglomeration of shocks, which are, of course, becoming incredibly expensive for industry. So the paramount aspect for the industry becomes really to quantify those uh, losses in order to understand how to build resilience along supply chains. And uh, more importantly, also understand how disruption interact with some of the global megatrends that have been going on for the past two decades. And this is then where our research also shifted, in fact, towards understanding the <clears throat> understanding the impacts of uh, some of the megatrends, which I will explain in a second. Apologies, my camera is on strike this morning. Um, so why we still believe, in fact, that GVC paradigm, as, as we know it, is, is, is likely to change over the coming decade or so. And I think one of the main reasons is that what some of the commentators have labeled the perfect storm, so that we find ourselves right now in a situation where a number of economic and social and, and environmental dynamics are coming together and reshaping industrial systems. And, and here I would maybe like to zoom in briefly on, on, on three of those core drivers of change, which uh, we consider key for understanding the future of uh, GVCs. And, and the first one is changing economic um, or economic power shifts in a way that, that we have been experiencing over the past two decades. The second one is of course, the issue of digital transformation, the fourth industrial revolution as we have studied in, in our last Industrial Development Report 2020. And the third aspect relates to environmental sustainability, of course, that is on everyone's agenda these days. So I think individually, but also in, in, in combination with each other, um, those uh, core drivers of, of change carry, of course, very strong implications for how future value um, will be uh, created and also distributed along the global value chains. And my first point here relates to, to the economic power shifts and, and GDCs. And um, what we have observed, of course, over the past two decades, longer is, is this, um, is the emergence of, of Asia and in particular East, East Asia with China at its core as a, as a center of uh, gravity and as a new cluster of, of economic industrial activity and innovation. So China in particular is no longer just the working bench of the world, it is the industry or manufacturing hub of the world. So <clears throat> those um, demand shifts, but also supply shifts, of course, um, have been um, facilitated largely by, by the growing middle classes and the very strong level of urbanization, but also domestic policies that um, East Asian countries have been uh, operationalizing. And they came, of course, on the, on the back of, of um, global trade and investment slowdown uh, since 2008, since the financial crisis, which, of course, resulted globally in, in drops in, in shares of uh, intermediate imports, uh, FDI, but at the same time have been um, stimulating growth of intra-regional trade, in particular in, in, in Asia. And I think that intra-regional trade, which also provides hints, of course, for the discussion, uh, or which has potentially some relevance for the discussion when it comes to other developing parts of the world, has been crucial in, in, in terms of um, widening the, the production nodes in GVCs in Asia. So the spillovers from China that went to other Asian economies have resulted in the fact that today we have more developing countries producing finished goods closer to key consumer markets, which also happen to be in Asia. So this pattern, of course, has been also reinforced by policy uncertainty, by escalating trade tensions, um, which is um, compounding this 
structural change within GVC. So I think taken together, uh, this trend um, increases the likelihood of um, fragmentation and, and likely shortening of GVCs towards more regional, regionalized structures, which are um, also largely defined by geopolitical dynamics. So I think this triad of, of you know, North America or US, Europe, and China and the surroundings becomes in a way the, the, the new focus. Um, my second point relates to, to digital transformation and, and global value chains. And of course, what we have been experiencing here again over the past uh, decade is the emergence of this new wave of digital technologies, which are fundamentally changing production systems. So we are observing a convergence and, and, and to a certain extent blending of new production technologies. Um, we are witnessing emergence of smart factories, so we are reading about them, not so much seeing them at present, but the fact is that they are coming. So, and they are facilitated largely by, I think, four key technologies that we have been focusing on or trying to understand better. And this is, uh, on the one hand, uh, the artificial intelligence, the auto autonomous robotics, um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing and Internet of Things, which taken together or combined will likely challenge our uh, current understanding of who makes what and where. So a, sort of a deviation from this linear model that we have known so far towards novel models uh, where manufacturers do not necessarily um, rely any longer on, on multiple stakeholders scattered across vast uh, geographies. And I think one of the key reasons for that or one of the some of or some of the key benefits for such uh, a drive towards these new production technologies is the need of manufacturers to reduce shipping and, and inventory costs to um, eliminate or reduce the lead time and, and also uh, to a large extent lower the risk of intellectual property theft, etc. So I think this drive towards um, smart factories enabled through new production technologies, I think is also largely driven by, um, uh, well, by, by consumer expectations, um, I think, which are also rapidly changing, um, which in turn is also largely facilitated by the rise of, of digital platforms. So these new matchmakers who are resetting the expectations of consumers towards wider choices and um, um, <clears throat> higher speeds and, and, and superior services, uh, and leading therefore to some sort of disintermediation of GVCs. Uh, another aspect that we're observing in a way that you're moving away from this linear model where you know, distributors and wholesalers, et cetera, uh, are controlling big chunks of the GVCs and determining what is being produced and how, of course. Um, and another aspect here, of course, that needs to be highlighted is uh, this emerging issue of digital decoupling. So in other words, breaking away of, of technologies which is a form of um, uh, you know, politization of technology uh, that largely happens through technical standard settings and increases the costs for firms to operate globally. So again, if you take a number of these issues uh, together, I think this raises the possibility of, of, of backshoring or reshoring or nearshoring as it's being called. Um, and I think it applies in particular, as Giuseppe was uh, referring to initially, to essential or strategic global value chains, um, which in turn, again, strengthens this argument for increasing regionalization of, of global value chains with um, um, uh, some evidence already going in that direction. If you, if you look at the recently released uh, uh, industrial policy strategies by the US, EU, uh, China, et cetera, which are all flagging the importance of uh, strategic interest industries and, and, and this issue of, of course, producing close to home markets or home countries. And my final point <clears throat> relates to the issue of environmental sustainability. Uh, as most of you, of course, will know, um, UN has uh, declared the, the climate uh, or global climate emergency as, as the greatest uh, single threat to sustainable development. And I think this issue is of particular relevance to the future of GVCs because we are already 
witnessing extreme weather events and natural disasters, which pose high risk mm. to supply chains. We have uh, ample evidence that multinational firms or lead firms in particular have been induced through such events to change their sor sourcing strategies uh, away from single towards multi-sourcing. In most instances, in fact, when we speak about multi-sourcing, it is speaking about you know, additional suppliers closer to home markets. So not so much necessarily an opportunity for developing countries, but rather in fact, an opportunity for developed countries to reclaim uh, uh, some of the supply chain. Um, we have also witnessed, of course, an increasing um, pressure on firms to uh, internalize environmental impacts, uh, largely through uh, emerging or novel regulatory, regulatory frameworks um, that uh, impose a cost on long distance uh, GVCs. And we, of course, also see the changing endowment structures of, of countries, especially when it comes to, say, natural resources, which, again, is disrupting operation on, of certain GVCs and encourages emergence of new value chains um, that are, uh, you know, uh, greener in their consumption patterns, if you think of renewables. But all of this, of course, is placing a premium on places um, with already, you know, solid endowments of knowledge and know-how and of course poses additional challenges for countries that are present um, at the periphery of global value chains. So I'll maybe um, uh, stop here uh, without now trying to uh, summarize what I've said. I, I hope that some of the other panelists who are to follow will pick up on, on, on some of these issues and um, uh, yeah, I, I, I look forward to discussing it further with you. Thank you, Adnan, uh, a great overview and uh, excellent start. Let me remind everybody that in the chat, you can, you can also put questions or reflections, and then we will try as much as we can to collect and then try to get to the panelists answering or commenting on, on them. And so, well, we, we are seeing, and Adnan was sending us, that we have, uh, I'm not summarized, but you know, you, you have digital politics, you have a new technology, you have, you have a new big demand for, for shifting towards something that is environmentally sustainable sustainable that it works for the planet. Now, uh, in a context in which we have, Fiona, we have who makes what, where changes, as, uh, as Adna was saying, I would add that where value is created and captured is changing too, if we especially look at the issue of the technology uh, and the platform economy that uh, it's kind of ruling a bit the, the reorganization uh, that we see in industrial system. Fiona, how do you think the risks and the challenges for developing countries uh, uh, linked to participation to value chain are changing? I mean, in our work so far, we were already very careful about saying, look, it's not that value chains are not like a free ticket to development, it's difficult. Uh, there are risks of remaining lock-in in certain uh, in certain areas. The opportunities for learning are not granted. Let's say you need to negotiate for them to, to make them happen. So how do you how do you see the, the future, Fiona, taking the perspective of, of developing countries? Yeah, well, th thanks, Annalisa, for the, the great question and uh, to the organizers um, and greetings to all of the, the participants from Johannesburg. I'm glad to be um, a part of this uh, topical and, and uh, important discussion. Um, I think when we look at the, the rise of uh, global value chains, which of course um, have always been there, but have become increasingly prominent um, in, in recent years, um, we can see the, the rising importance of intra-industry uh, trade in, in intermediate goods. So what's been referred to as a vertical specialization, industrialization. Uh, and to some extent, this challenges the old kind of ISI input substituting and, and export orienting uh, paradigms. Um, in the sense that it, it reconfigures the global organization of, of production. Um, and while we can draw insights from those uh, paradigms, um, it also brings a, a new way of thinking. Um, and of course, one of the important changes um, with the, within global value chains uh, is the powerful role of lead firms in controlling market access um, and uh, flows of both materials um, and knowledge within uh, GVCs. So in terms of the, the risks and opportunities, um, as, you, as you mentioned, Annalisa, I think global value chains certainly do make it easier 
for low income countries um, to break into manufacturing. Um, and this is particularly for uh, countries that have only a, a nascent uh, manufacturing sector um, and not well developed uh, or, or large uh, manufacturing sector in the sense that uh, they don't need to produce along the whole value chain. Uh, they can gain a foothold in relatively um, easy uh, segments, although those easier segments also tend to have uh, low returns as, as we'll discuss a bit more. Um, and But that kind of a foothold um, may or, or, or may not turn into a stepping stone. Um, so I think there's a high degree of, of contingency in the outcomes for, for developing countries. And certainly there, there is a risk um, for developing countries um, of being stuck in the more low value added uh, parts of, of, of value chains. Um, uh, and one particular concern with that from a kind of uh, structural transformation uh, perspective is that where uh, developing countries um, get stuck in those kind of uh, low value added, low returns uh, segments of, of, the, of the value chains, um, this can actually potentially weaken um, the growth pulling uh, role of manufacturing and the, the growth pulling role of uh, industrialization um, in, in developing countries um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think, is that uh, excessive uh, reliance on uh, GVC um, integration in, in developing countries um, can potentially weaken the domestic linkages between manufacturing um, and other uh, sectors of, of the domestic economy in the sense that uh, the manufacturing production can become uh, more oriented uh, towards linkages uh, with, with the, the rest of the international value chain rather than with uh, domestic value chains. A second way, perhaps through in, in which uh, excessive reliance on, on value chains um, exporting can, can, perhaps, uh, can potentially weaken the growth pulling potential of, of uh, manufacturing um, is that it can um, weaken the increasing returns to scale and associated uh, productivity gains in, in manufacturing in the sense that um, productivity gains um, uh, to manufacturing in developing countries um, can sometimes be largely captured uh, by, by the lead firms uh, with buying power. Um, and I think thirdly, it can potentially also weaken the extent to which um, manufacturing is growth pulling through the kind of innovation and R&D channel um, in, in the sense that uh, these activities um, often tend to happen um, elsewhere outside of developing countries, most commonly in the, in the home country of, of the lead firm. So these are some of the risks in which uh, yes, uh, obviously manufacturing uh, through and, and exporting of, of manufacturers uh, through GVCs can still be growth pulling, but some of those effects uh, can be weakened through excessive reliance on, on, on value chains. So we can see a scenario in which, um, for example, if developing countries are focused mainly on just final assembly activities uh, within value chains, um, yes, it can generate some foreign exchange, can generate some employment, which are obviously important, but not necessarily driving industrialization um, and structural change. So it can be a form of kind of thin in, in industrialization. So linked to this is, is the risk of um, integrating globally while uh, delinking uh, domestically. Um, so if, uh, again, if there's an excessive reliance on uh, GVC integration, um, which is, is not linked to the rest of the domestic economy, um, it has the potential not to strengthen and, and, and pull along the rest of, of domestic manufacturing. But I think it's important to, to recognize, and uh, this comes back to what you were alluding to, Annalisa, that these are risks. They're not inevitabilities, um, but they are risks. So um, it takes strategic uh, policy choices and, and effort for, for developing countries um, to avoid these um, and to, to manage these risks. Um, and I would seek kind of two broad uh, strategic uh, policy thrusts um, for developing countries um, to maximize uh, the opportunities and the benefits of, of GVC engagement um, while minimizing and, and, and managing the, uh, these risks. Um, the first of these thrusts I see as, as maximizing the linkages and um, positive spillovers with the domestic economy. So um, it's crucial to, to foster the linking back um, of uh, domestic uh, uh, value chain production with uh, the rest of the domestic economy. So with local producers um, and local supply chains. 
Um, so this is what uh, um, Antonio Andreoni and myself have, uh, and uh, Antonio, uh, some of his own separate work um, has referred to as uh, linking up while linking back. So linking up with uh, global value chains whilst linking back uh, with the domestic economy. Um, and for this, of course, uh, local production system development um, is really key. Uh, obviously, it's not something that happens automatically because this is not uh, the linking back with the domestic economy is not something that's going to be on the agenda of, of lead firms. Um, it's certainly not going to be a priority for them. So it's something which is up to, to firms and policymakers um, in, in developing countries um, to ensure that this, this happens. Um, and for this, uh, it, it's really important to maximize uh, linkages between uh, the manufacturing production, which is part of the GVCs, um, and the rest of, of uh, the domestic economy, not only supply linkages, but also technological skill uh, linkages, uh, skills linkages, and, and, and so on. Um, and it needs uh, targeted policy interventions to actively cultivate uh, these linkages, which won't necessarily happen automatically. Um, and then secondly, and I think my, my, my last uh, uh, comment for, for now, is obviously the importance of upgrading. We cannot talk about uh, GVC uh, engagement in, in developing countries without putting um, upgrading at, at the center. Um, and uh, there's a by, by GVC upgrading, I think broadly we're referring to um, improving the ability of, of a firm or of a, a developing economy to move towards um, more profitable and more technologically sophisticated activities um, with higher value creation um, potential and to capture more of the value that's created from them. So here we can include um, product upgrading, um, so moving towards more sophisticated product lines, um, process upgrading, um, functional upgrading, so doing uh, different kinds of uh, functions within the, the value chain, um, or intersectoral value, uh, intersectoral up upgrading, so moving into, uh, into new or often related activities. So typically we find that the kinds of value chain activities which have the highest barriers to entry so that the most difficult for developing countries to get into typically have the highest returns. Those things go together. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's easy to talk about upgrading. It's not always so easy to do either for, for, for uh, firms um, or, or, for, or for economies. Um, so uh, upgrading within value chains obviously requires um, higher capability thresholds um, for which uh, technological upgrading is a prerequisite, but it's not only about uh, technological capabilities, it's about a, a much broader range of, of uh, capabilities. Um, and this sort of upgrading is, is far from automatic. So just simply producing in the, in the lower value added parts of the, of the value chain does not automatically upgrade um, domestic capabilities or provide a, a, a platform for, for that upgrading. Um, so let me perhaps uh, yeah, leave it there um, and hopefully we can uh, explore some of the, the issues further later. Thank you, Fiona, for, for putting this so clearly. And uh, if I try to, to rephrase it a bit in how we have been working in this through the policy dialogue that uh, Pio Giuseppe was mentioning at the beginning and that uh, most of you have been already participating into, we I think we all share the fact that you're telling us GVC participation is definitely not an objective per se for developing countries because what you make out of it depends on how you strategically enter for it. What is your objective? Do you want to industrialize your economy? Well, then maybe GVCs are a feature of the global organization of production that you have to be aware of and that you can try to exploit at your own advantage. But it is not simply by saying I'm going to enter into this or I'm going to develop some providers for this big lead firm, that development um, spillovers will just accrue automatically. So I would say you're telling us you need to have another objective, which is probably industrializing your economy and creating local capabilities. And now do you use the value chain strategically? And so I would say you have two three key things here. Now you're saying you need to negotiate because there is an issue of power. This was evident also from, from Adnan's point of view. It's, a, it's not something easy. And you want to prioritize learning probably because by definition, you will have some short-term gains. Huh? The exchange rate you mentioned, I mean, it's the, it's the currency, it's uh, as employment, but then how do you create a dynamic opportunities for learning and how do you move this, uh, this negotiation? Uh, I think that uh, you're basically calling for an active modern industrial policy that is able to manage GVCs for 
each country's interest and then each country is different interest and the negotiation is uh, is around the corner maybe you can pick up on this uh, a little bit later but you're making a point that makes me think about we have the possibility to have Tawid with us from Indonesia so yes. how how do you see that these trends uh, put forward both by Amdan and by by Fiona, what's the Indonesia's perspective here and what can policies do and how do you see the opportunities or challenges for Indonesia challenged? Uh, we, we have two important uh, big overviews. Uh, when we go into the specific country you, you represent and you're working in and for, uh, what can you tell us? Yeah, thank you Annalisa for giving me opportunity and also Pepe, thank you. Yeah, uh, um, in my opinion, what uh, Adnan said, and also with uh, also with Fiona, as I think it's right. Yes, uh, that's a lot of idea that uh, we already talking about it. Uh, I think uh, from the data said the decline in FDI in the popping country, more or less about sixteen uh, percent, was slower than the developed country. This indicate that the decrease in GVC participation in the developing country is not higher as in the developing country. The following country will have the opportunity to mobilize FDI from from uh, from various countries by seeing the tendency that depending on one country for manufacturing locus is very risky. I think it is a momentum for developing country to take role by looking at the linkage of EDN in one regional. So uh, maybe if we uh, took like uh, FDI in China for electronic product and can we will be closely to related to FDI in Vietnam, Indonesia. The same case for, uh, for automatic product where FDI in Thailand will be closely related to FDI in India or Indonesia. That's, I think that's uh, if we uh, look at for the regional issue. The second issue, I agree that uh, some, uh, some uh, some cases that uh, uh, also this COVID has impact to uh, to uh, diversification of product that uh, COVID has also impact to a uh, high level of GVC participation of products such as computer, electronic, and so on. But this bit, but in the pandemic situation, the need of primary daily product is high compared to that product. Developing country like Indonesia, partly based on their GFI or those product will make difficulty and their GFI participation will decline. I think, like or not, for this situation, for this situation, uh, we bring to the accelerate the the the, the combine of product more higher participation is uh, so impo uh, very important. Uh, COVID uh, also bring uh, to our country accelerate this digitalization, such as the technology uh, more important, such uh, what have happened in Indonesia, we we growing faster for uh, health sector, like uh, uh, for like, uh, like uh, vaccine. So uh, uh, developing countries that are very limited in handling COVID will always face obstacle in in uh, in uh, with tighter market barriers to non-tariff measure will increase compared to tariff measure. I think the the one problem if uh, with uh, with this uh, about the health health issue is very important when the when the non-tariff measure that might rise. I think it's one issue that we have to handle it like like Indonesia. Another issue I think. Uh, with this case about the health also with the uh, with the pandemic is uh, with the with the uh, vaccine and also medicine to handle the the, the covid we 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 trying to uh, this opportunity uh, this opportunity because uh, because uh, is uh, the, the the pandemic more more uh, give us a chance to introduce new technology, a new uh, technology in health sector, because you know, as Indonesia, uh, uh, we 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 observe uh, uh, observe uh, vaccine from other country like US, from India, and so on. But we know uh, that uh, that uh, not only uh, not only the, the the material from other country like uh, basic material of medicine, but the technology also important for health center for the pandemic case. I think 
that we we have uh, with them in the last uh, the last maybe six or or in the last six year because you know in the pandemic certain uh, the 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 rapidness of the vaccine is very important to to make our GVC or to make our economic condition more stable than uh, than before the pandemic. I think that uh, very very uh, that's that's what 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 happened in Indonesia in the last in the last year. I think uh, that's all what uh, we uh, what what we do. I think uh, I agree with Atan also uh, Fiona what what they are discussed before. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you, thank you, Said. By by listening to you, you, you make me uh, think of a word that is very uh, very dear to Anta and to Pierre Giuseppe and Richard uh, and Richard Kuzul Bright uh, division in Anta, the policy space. Huh? Like last week, we were having a, a discussion, uh, impressive with India, the US, uh, um, um, Italy and, and South Africa and uh, and it was quite uh, important to listen to to the US with the new this new unit on industrial policy in the White House and the budget budget and management office saying well you know we need to industrialize and we need to get industries back so we do need to use the policy space and if the policy space is not there we can work to make it existing. And I, what you're saying to us is that the context is changing so much that we have to look at what are the rules that exist at the national level, but also at the international level that can enable developing countries to industrialize, learn, and, and upgrade their capabilities. And I take from more point to something that maybe we can pick up in the discussion later, all in the panel of, of experience in this, which is the issue of strategic industries. I think something that also prior to the pandemic was evident, but within, with this pandemic, it's probably more into everybody's visibility that uh, of course every industry matter, but there are some industries that are like strategic for national interest, but also in the global interest, uh, I would say that in my personal point of view, the, the health uh, healthcare system, industrial system is particularly crucial. And wherever you create capabilities is also going to be good for the world. So we, we have to have this in mind. You know, we want more capacities there to serve the global world. That's not only for a specific national interest. Uh, let me let me bring in the conversation, um, Francesco. From, uh, from the work you do uh, as professor of economics in, in Bari with uh, looking at Africa and the least, uh, least developed countries, uh, how do you see these opportunities and challenges linked to, to value chain that we have been hearing so far from Adnan, Fiona, and from Tawi? The, what do you see from the perspective of, of LDCs and, and Africa, Francesco? What can you put on the table for, for our debate? Okay. Uh, thanks, Annalisa, and thanks, uh, uh, Pierre Giuseppe, for inviting me. Uh, I think, I mean, we, we need this kind of, uh, of discussion because my opinion is that, I mean, for, uh, in particular, for African countries, the, the new scenario was... Um, uh, really tough challenges. I mean, uh, my colleague made uh, my task easier because I'm, I mostly agree with Adam and, and Fiona. So let me start with um, recall the, the two main uh, risks that I see for uh, the LDCs. So the first, in the, you know, I mean, in this new scenario of uh, we see now a reconfiguration no, of uh, value chain. So uh, the first risk is uh, the fourth industrial revolution, of course. And the second one, in my opinion, is um, uh, the crisis of the liberal uh, international order, no? the renaissance of uh, geopolitics. And this is particularly, um, these are particularly tough challenges, as I said, because I mean, these two forces are uh, mutually reinforcing, you know? So uh, I think that with um, four a year, uh, the question is, uh, I mean, whether the least developed country uh, can use this um, export-based manufacturing as a path to prosperity. Uh, I worry that uh, some developing economies in Africa 
risk uh, losing jobs, uh, losing uh, manufacturing capabilities that uh, have accumulated in these last decades with I mean, effort, no? with, uh, with hard effort. While other countries risk to be a risk, I mean, a sort of um, ever growing marginalization. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, the traditional forcing forces no, uh, generating what we call the flying geese pattern are maybe no longer in place. Uh, so the point is that uh, developing country, in particular African country, have the, um, the necessary complementary skills to attract, uh, I mean, the parts of the value chain that still require workers, no? Uh, so, I think this is, uh, uh, I mean, the, the central point. No, we need to, um, I mean, better understanding the, the potential uh, of um, industry 4.0 for, for, uh, for these countries. Um, at the same time, so to, to move to your question, I think that um, African countries uh, uh, have, uh, so a, a window of opportunity, okay? Uh, because uh, on one side, we need that uh, African countries uh, adapt to the digital future, of course. Otherwise, we risk uh, much more mar marginalization for, uh, for those countries. But uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, there is uh, the possibility uh, for, um, for African countries to develop those sectors that are uh, still uh, until, until now less automated. No, where uh, technological installation uh, has been slow. So uh, I think now we have this window of opportunity. Of course, uh, the time is important because uh, it's this window of opportunity will uh, remain open for maybe one decade, two decades, and then uh, the growing uh, the digital future will uh, change uh, will change the, the the world. This could be this window of opportunity, in my opinion, is be particularly important in. Um, labor intensive GVC that target consumer in emerging countries. I mean, at least in the, in the short to medium, uh, to medium term. And in this respect, I think it's important to, uh, to work for establishing a regional value chain. Okay, of course, it's not an easy task. No, we know that uh, it, it's not uh, easy to do that, that it requires uh, regional coordination. Uh, but I think, as Tahid said, uh, this, is the uh, this is the momentum for uh, value chain regionalization. Uh, I mean, and I think that uh, the geopolitical uh, tension will, um, I mean, Will be uh, will push in the in the next uh, in the next year this uh, this trend. Of course, uh, I mean uh, we need uh, policies to do that. Uh, I think that uh, an enduring effort uh, in this stage is important uh, for building indigenous capabilities and for. Um, searching uh, niches for domestic market needs. Uh, so we, I can say, uh, we need something that we need as development strategies, uh, more focused, less focused on uh, international economic integration, in my opinion, and more focused on what me, um, we might call a sort of domestic integration, as uh, Fiona said, domestic and regional uh, in integration. So uh, I think that in this moment, the key challenge is to, uh, I mean, disseminate uh, through the, the economy, the capabilities already in place in some uh, uh, least developed countries. So the idea to create this sort of uh, domestic linkages and uh, I think this could be uh, an important opportunity for, for African countries, of course, and uh, 
this is my second and uh, final point uh, on, on the policy perspective. Uh, I think it's not easy, but I think that developing countries need to be uh, more proactive in, uh, in the international uh, arena. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the uh, African countries, least developing countries are not so present in the debate and the decision making process at uh, the multinational level. But there are uh, several issues that um, are crucial for, uh, are crucial for uh, African countries. And in my opinion, these issues are linked to digital standard, intellectual property, ownership of, of data and intangibles, uh, as well as uh, digital trade and, uh, and taxation. I mean, I think that African countries need a much more uh, proactive uh, role in this um, in the multinational uh, arena, even because another possibility, I think, uh, the, this country have in the, in the next future is in the services. So we know that um, now uh, much more services uh, uh, are tradable. And so I think that uh, this open another, uh, I hope, another window of opportunity for, uh, for those countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Very extremely interesting to, to listen to you. We, we do support also in the work we do at the policy dialogue, uh, your call for anticipation capacities of what could matters next and the importance of the international tables where we do need the developing countries to participate and then to find a way to have a voice. We know it's not easy. And uh, then uh, probably Chris Giuseppe will mention something in his concluding remarks uh, as Ankara is traditionally a place where, where countries are, are voicing this, this need. Um, but it is particularly important in areas, as you're saying, where standards are not defined yet. It is important to, to be at the table. Um, Thanks for also for pointing the risk of growing marginalization at the country level. I think this is a particularly important point, not an easy solution. Uh, we don't have a, probably a solution to put uh, at the table, but having this in mind can help us to think of solutions. Normally, when you have growing marginalization, we do probably need some global funds to, to see how do we address this practically. Um, and and your, your point on, uh, on the development strategy uh, and, the, and the need for these strategies to really see how do we create capabilities within, which is a lot linked to, to the work uh, that Fiona and, and Antonio, Antonio are doing and what Fiona mentioned. Uh, this brings me to, if I may, I'd like to ask like a second round of questions to all of you. And then I have seen three very interesting questions in the chat. So I'll, 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 ask, um, I'll ask a couple of questions and then we can, we can see the questions in the chat. I can, I can uh, streamline them for you. But uh, this point that Francesco made about the, the policy basically makes me think that maybe if I can ask to Adnan and Fiona to, to step in and, and tell us a bit from the industrial policy point of view, because at the end of the day, of course, value chains is trade, and we know the trade and investment policies are very powerful policies that define a lot of the space that exists. But then what you're calling for and what we told us they are doing in Indonesia is actually implementing national strategies to try and address very specific issues. So Fiona mentioned too, we need to see how do we create the density within the economy to avoid the dual economy and we need to promote learning and, um, and, uh, and upgrading and uh, using the, the trade and FDI to really create the learning processes within the countries. There could be other functions that industrial policies perform, uh, both linked to the Industry 4.0 or other areas. So if both Adnan and Fiona could step in a little bit in the debate with what is changing for industrial policy in this changing scenario for value chain, what, what would be your, your key recommendation or your key reflection? Adnan, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. And thank you, Annalisa. And I will be also very brief uh, uh, because I, I take it that we would also like to take some uh, questions from, from the floor. Um, <clears throat> what role for industrial policy? Well, I, I do think that, or at least in our work, um, that uh, 
you know, the, the, the mega trends, which uh, I've been briefly outlining in my initial remarks are, um, can give us some indication or guidance as to how we should think about the future of industrial policy as well. And uh, in particular, in the context of um, decreasing uh, the rising inequalities, both between and uh, within countries. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, the recently re released um, industrial policy strategies, um, you know, by the US, by, by China, EU, UK, um, and just highlighting uh, uh, the importance of this, uh, of this topic. And, um, <clears throat> you know, industrial policy these days, of course, is becoming almost a fashionable term, so not, not something that you shy away from talking about. And we have been trying to, 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 to think at our end here as well as to what are some of these kind of generic policy areas and features that countries should embrace, irrespective of whether they are developed or developing or emerging, because ultimately megatrends are affecting um, all countries in different ways, of course, but I think there are certain fundamentals, if you want, that uh, policymakers will have to focus on if they are to um, benefit from some of the you know, positive uh, changes that megatrends are, um, uh, are bringing to their um, uh, countries uh, and industries, but also to counter, of course, some of the negative trends that are uh, inevitably associated with, with megatrends as well. And I think the, the you know, key flavor of today, of course, is this aspect of uh, GVC resilience, of course, um, in particular in strategic industries. I think if you um, look at the, uh, the industrial policy strategies of the more advanced countries that have been now released, they, they speak about you know, resilience in very specific industries, but I think ultimately the discussion is about you know, future competitiveness and how to ensure future competitiveness in, 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 in those industries. Um, and uh, for that, I think, you know, what they are putting forward as areas where um, government or public policy has to intervene, I think, can, some, can be summed up under three main, I would say, industrial policy pillars. And I think the first one relates to infrastructure, the second one to education, and, and the third one to, to, to innovation. And I think in terms of infrastructure, of course, um, I think there will be, of course, a, an increasing focus on, on, on either provision or adoption of, of critical digital infrastructure in particular. Uh, I think if we are to you know, take use from what may come in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, then in order to operate those smart factories, et cetera, you will have to have uh, you know, state-of-the-art digital infrastructure. You will not be able to run it without it. And I, and I think there are already um, there, there is growing evidence, of course, that in places that have these superstar cities and superstar firms, there are also massive investments in ensuring digital infrastructure uh, is in place to cater to their needs. Um, what goes hand in hand with that, and this is my second point, is, of course, the aspect of education. So uh, here the focus explicitly on, on, on building private but also public sector capabilities. Uh, that are in line with local endowments. And I think uh, Fiona was initially alluding to that in her uh, intervention in a way that capabilities become the absolute key and prerogative for industrial policy. So how to foster state-of-the-art capabilities that can cater to the needs of 4IR, the fourth industrial uh, revolution. And I think this is a very pertinent question also for developing countries, of course, because if the path or the target is still to uh, foster development to a certain extent through GVC participation, then I think the current times are just raising the bar for them and they need to embrace uh, this, this um, policy item of building capabilities, focusing in fact on their local endowments in particular. So not just any type of capabilities, but capabilities that are in line with their local endowments. And, and uh, bringing these two aspects together, infrastructure or digital infrastructure on the one hand and, and, and knowledge on the other, I think they are key inputs for uh, you know, fostering the emergence of, of uh, local 
ecosystems or a network approach to innovation. I think this is absolutely um, key at present. So policies that help redeploy and, and grow specific competencies in, in, in specific industries. Uh, and, I, and, and ecosystems, of course, is not a new term. It has been used for a very long time and we understand it also pretty well, but I think it's uh, especially import, of importance right now where you actually, where you see that in order to create the infrastructure that is needed in order to create um, the capabilities that you need, you need a strong system of innovation in place that can help policymakers you know, navigate those murky waters. And I think for developing countries in particular, what that means is also refocusing their efforts towards investment facilitation in particular. Um, I think we, what we do need is a, is a whole of a government approach, if you want, uh, that encourages uh, responsible and at the same time also sustainable investment uh, by, by, by providing um, uh, new and in existing investors with uh, you know, transparent and, and predictable and efficient um, regulatory frameworks. Uh, because a lot of that knowledge that needs to be locally created will take a long time uh, to, to uh, be developed um, organically. And I think you know, the right type of investments uh, can facilitate and speed up uh, that process. And, and one additional point uh, that I would like to make also in connection to what both Fiona and Francesco said is that uh, this uh, aspect of also understanding the, um, uh, the internal structures or internal developed for uh, potential for developing uh, domestic uh, value chains also to balance the growing regional disparities uh, within countries. And here I think a policy effort could be geared towards you know, governments adopting this bottom-up approach uh, to, to policy making and um, you know, supporting creation or emergence of regional ecosystems. You know, I think EU has, has a, a, a fairly interesting model in place where they you know, encourage regional smart specialization strategies where uh, regions uh, you know, place increased effort understanding their local endowments and defining regional strategies and then sort of matching their set of skills and capabilities with um, other regions and therefore strengthening emergence of these type of um, regional value chains or supply chains. And lastly, I, I think the point is, of course, as usual, to um, engage more with the multilateral system. I think being inward looking is, uh, is, is only part of the story. It's not the solution, certainly. So we need to engage more with, or countries need to engage more with the multilateral system and foster cross-border cooperation, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, issues that we now face with respect to, uh, you know, uh, data privacy or the role of data within JVCs, when we talk about digital trade, etc. I think multilateral system is the only way forward on these issues. Um, so I'll maybe stop here and, and hand over to Fiona. I'm sure she will add a few. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adnan, and thanks for pointing to you know the basics. We need the education, we need the ecosystem, we need the infrastructure and the digital infrastructure. Like it's a no go. This should happen. Now, Fiona, if you, if you bring us to the details of the industrial policy uh, targeting the domestic capabilities, can can you can you share some final thoughts on your on your side for on this? Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll largely concur with what uh, Adnan and the other panelists have said. I think we, we're very much on the same uh, page on this. Um, in terms of industrial policy specifically, um, in relation to, to uh, the realities of uh, GVCs, um, I think I would see the, the, the two key thrusts as, as those which I outlined um, earlier. Um, on the one hand, supporting the maximizing of, uh, of linkages and um, positive spillovers, spillovers with the domestic economy, and, and secondly, around um, upgrading. So in relation to industrial policy specifically, I think, uh, you know, broadly, everything that we've been saying about uh, industrial policy and what matters and what's important for industrial policy remains important in the GVC context. It's not that like, totally different uh, industrial policies are, are, are needed. So everything which we've been saying around industrial policy, and, uh, the importance of investment, of uh, 
productive capabilities of, and, and so on. All of this uh, remains as important um, in the GVC context. It's just that it needs specific tailoring to, uh, to, to GVCs. So for instance, uh, you know, one of the key thrusts of industrial policy has always been supporting of um, upgrading um, and, and technological advancement and so on. This has always been a, a key priority of uh, industrial policy, industrialization, structural transformation. So in the GVC context, it just needs specific tailoring to the nature of uh, upgrading um, within and, and between uh, GVCs. Um, a second example, we've always been talking in, in, uh, in terms of industrial policy around kind of disciplining capital and uh, industrial ecosystems and uh, state market e interface and so on. So that remains important. Um, it does that it has specificities in relation to, to, to GBCs, in particular the powerful lead firms, which are typically or almost always not based in the, the developing country. And that the state has uh, uh, less power to, uh, very limited power to directly uh, uh, discipline or, or regulate those kinds of uh, lead firms. I, I guess I would also pick up on um, some of the, the things which um, Adnan and uh, the other colleagues have, have raised around kind of technological changes um, uh, for our R and so on, and the impact of that for, for GBCs and for industrial policy in, in relation to, to GBCs. Um, the, 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 I think uh, Tahuid also referred to the possibilities of, of reshoring or, or backshoring of, of some GVC activities that are currently undertaken in, in developing countries, for example, around um, assembly, um, and the risks for developing countries that instead of upgrading from those, they might even uh, lose the, the, the little uh, which they have um, from, from GVCs. So broadly, I would say that um, Success in the context of uh, 4R and technological change and, and, and GVCs, it requires everything that uh, success in industrialization has, has always needed, but more on top of that. Um, so the importance of, uh, of productive capabilities, not only in relation to, to digital technologies um, and those advanced uh, 4R technologies, um, but much more broadly than that. So developing countries need that kind of core base um, of productive capabilities um, in manufacturing and in related industries and um, related segments of the economy um, in order to succeed in the adoption and the use and, and the, even the production of uh, advanced technologies. So this points to the importance of both kind of traditional industrial capabilities um, and new and emerging capabilities and the industrial policy uh, that's needed uh, to cultivate uh, the, all, all of those. Um, and these kinds of um, in narrowing the, the, the gap um, in uh, digital capabilities entails the meeting of uh, minimum sort of thresholds um, and, and, and preconditions. And these are, of course, highly relevant uh, to engagement in GVCs. Um, and uh, meeting of, of those thresholds and capabilities um, largely mediates uh, the nature and, and the benefits of developing countries' um, engagement with, within GVCs. So this calls for industrial policy that has a, an intensified focus um, on strengthening productive capabilities in, in uh, manufacturing. Um, and for the key kind of transversal uh, enablers, so skills, um, digital infrastructure, the regulatory framework, um, and so on. Um, as well as for, I mean, Annalise, you, you referred to uh, targeting as a, obviously a, a key traditional part of, an, of industrial policy. I think part of that is identifying the opportunities for leapfrogging, which could in practice uh, be, be limited. I think we have to be careful not to kind of overstate uh, possibilities of, of, uh, of leapfrogging, um, because obviously there's this importance of incrementally building up uh, that base of capabilities. But where there are possibilities of leapfrogging, um, even if limited, so including within and, and, and between GVCs, um, industrial policy obviously has a, a, a key role in identifying um, and, and, and creating those. So I think um, yeah, aspects of this include you know, uh, skills development um, and, and again, not only limited to the kind of new skills that are associated with uh, changing technologies um, and uh, future skills, uh, but much more uh, broadly. Um, and support uh, industrial policy support for the adoption of uh, digitalization to improve supply chain integration. So the digitalization of both uh, production and supply chains. 
So I think, again, it comes back to what we, we discussed earlier. Um, yes, some of this is new, but some of this is, is actually old. Um, and the, the key importance of, of upgrading and of industrial policy to support that upgrading um, in order for developing um, countries and, and firms in those to get as much as possible out of global value chains um, and, and to minimize um, and manage the associated risks. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Let me pick on your point of, of some of this is old and it's true, and some of this is new. Uh, but in the new, we do have an issue which Francesco put very clearly in, in his remarks, and uh, some of you mentioned also, which is the issue of the regional dimension. I'm not making clear at the beginning, too. So the uh, continental, when we look at Africa, or the regional dimension for other parts of the world in terms of a key feature of the potential future of industrial systems. And maybe if I if I can try to, to get both Tawid and Francesco get uh, uh, a reaction on their side, elaborating a little bit more on the new perspectives in Africa. We have the new Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that if properly managed could open opportunities for industrialization. This is at least the vision put forward by, by the Africa Union Commission. Uh, we have RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in the, in the Asia region. So we have new agreements in, on, on the table that could change how, how these industrialization patterns take place. And they could be, they would need effective industrial policies that link to them to benefit, it's not by opening up a market that you create an incentive for industrialization, but if properly steered, that they could be an important support. And there are uh, there are a couple of questions actually linked to this uh, regional focus or regional dimension. There was a question by Ziami on the Gulf Corporation Council. So what in terms of new shoring opportunities for the GCC in case you want to flag this into your answer and there was a, a very gentle request I can't see the name on tell us a little bit more about what does this mean for least developed countries and eventually small developing islands um, on this uh, with uh, Pier Giuseppe we're thinking of a session of the plenary meeting on small states and small developing island and industrial policy so be patient with us if Francesco or Tawid I'm not going to address this now and uh, if you can step in, then maybe, maybe we can have one last minute. There are also some interesting questions I'd like to address everybody. And then each of you can have like a final minute to conclude or reflect. Um, Tawid, do you want to go first? Uh, tell yeah. us about the regional dimension and then I will get Francisco. Yes, thank you. Uh, this question for me to address the, about the industrial policy for the bad trip. Yeah, I think about this question. Previously, Indonesia had battery, uh, had battery material, namely nickel, or and it was sent to the in the simplest forum. True, most of it's exported to China with more about uh, sixty-eight percent. This will centrally make uh, added value received by Indonesia smaller. However, since January one, two thousand and twenty, there has been a policy for export in the form of nickel. However. This step is later by building smelter in Indonesia so that the export is even better. This alone uh, is not enough so that government invite investor and there are new investor, maybe you know Hyundai, LG will build factory in Indonesia. Several investors will also follow, including from China. Of course, this will increase the global, global value chain considering that making electric battery also require other raw material from other countries. The downstream industrialization process is not easy for the developing country. This requires the transfer of energy, the human resource to different trading strategy. For this reason, an upgrading policy is needed, not only only product, but also for upgrading process even more broadly. For the developing country, I think the lesson, the lesson is how firm its government is to their industrial policy. This policy will also change the DVC landscape especially for developing countries that have competence in east of the GPC process. I think that's, uh, I think that's a very valuable, uh, valuable, uh, valuable uh, process in Indonesia that if we, uh, Indonesia mostly uh, has uh, natural resources uh, product, not only the, the, for, the, uh, for the mining, but also for the uh, planting, so I think this uh, listen learn from this uh, from this side, 
I think uh, we, we have to confirm that ourselves is ourselves uh, is have uh, have a main a main main GVC uh, for uh, investor to come to uh, developing country. So uh, we we have to prepare our human resource technology, even digitalization. I think it's well. Uh, it's, I think it's the preparation of uh, how do we. Uh, how we to accelerate uh, the GVC, I think more broadly and uh, more uh, more deeply. Thank you. Thank you, David Francisco. Yes, uh, I definitely think that I mean the Africa free trade area could be, I mean, really the game changer that uh, reverses the state of art uh, in Africa. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, COVID uh, as uh, the pandemic, COVID pandemic has, uh, I mean, highlighted that African economies are interconnected and have highlighted that we need these uh, regional uh, responses uh, to, uh, to these tough changes, challenges, no, and that uh, we need to move beyond no, the national, uh, the national board. So I definitely think that is a, a really good opportunity. In particular, as I said before, I think that this free trade area could be really important uh, in the reconfiguration of GVC. Uh, because, no, as, uh, as I already said, we know that, um, I mean, uh, the cost differentials in, uh, in MNE's decision are not so important now. Uh, and so there is, uh, I mean, it's much more important uh, uh, the, the market dimension, no? So there is, uh, I mean, we move from uh, efficiency uh, seeking FDI to market seeking FDI. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that uh, uh, mass customization, uh, economies of scope uh, will become much more important than uh, mass production and economies of scale. If this is true, and I think this is true, uh, the new free trade area could be uh, really important in this uh, respect. Anyway, we know that uh, a free trade agreement uh, per se is not a panacea, okay? We know that, uh, I mean, it's difficult to integrate uh, countries at uh, different level of, um, of development. And we know that this is the case for, for Africa also, uh, country that differs in terms of uh, size, uh, in terms of the diversification of economic structure. So we need to, um, to uh, adopt specific measure to, um, I mean, to avoid that uh, the least developed country will uh, uh, be, um, I mean, will, uh, will not benefit from the participation uh, in, this, uh, in this free trade area. So I think that we need uh, for a while, I mean, to use what we, we can say, not the, the traditional flexibility instruments, uh, so a special uh, differential treatment for uh, the economies that are uh, most vulnerable, uh, because, I mean, we have an empirical evidence that uh, we can also have, uh, I mean, difficulties for countries uh, in, uh, in this, um, I mean, adopting these uh, uh, free trade policies. Uh, of course, we need that, uh, especially the, um, the small economies uh, undertake the, I mean, the necessary structural transformation of their economies in order to diversify, diversify uh, their production and therefore in order to capture the benefits from uh, bioeconomic uh, integration. At the same time, uh, I need that there are other, um, other points that is important to highlight to, uh, to get benefit from this kind of agreement. And uh, first of all is uh, political support. 
okay, we know that uh, now there is political support, but we need that this political support uh, will remain in the future. And I think we need uh, an active engagement of uh, the private sector, of the NGOs, no, a, an active involvement of, of um, all the relevant stakeholders to, I mean, to get benefit from this kind of policies. Uh, I think that, as I, again, as I said before, we need, of course, agreements on goods, but we need agreements on services. These are, these are really important in this, uh, in this context, uh, because, I mean, I think that trading services will become uh, important in the future. Uh, I think to e-commerce, for example, again, intellectual uh, property, all these uh, uh, issue I think are, criti are critical for uh, to Africa's uh, future, and uh, again I need uh, I think that another important point uh, is to include informal trade. So we should care not only of uh, not only about formal trade, but we should care also about um, non-formal uh, non-formal trade. I think that if we uh, take into due account uh, all uh, these aspects, uh, I mean, I'm uh, confident that this free trade area could be, I mean, uh, really, really important for the Africa futures. If, but very, very briefly, may add two, uh, a couple of things to what uh, Adam said. Um, I think I, I'm working on uh, smart specialization in Europe, and uh, I think that he is right when he said that we could pick up some uh, feature of that kind of strategy that could be important in the in the regional, uh, also in the in the development of um, of African economies. And the, uh, the last thing is about uh, reskilling and upskilling. Of course, uh, I'm totally agree that is important, but I would like to highlight the importance to consider that uh, the impact of what, of what we call a 4IR is really heterogeneous in the sense that in this concept, we have very different, different technologies and this different technology have, may have a different impact. So I think it's important to, I mean, very in-depth analysis on this because uh, sometimes we use this as a slogan. I, 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 have, I have done the same uh, to be, uh, uh, to be you know, a short in, in, uh, in speaking, uh, but I think that we need to take into account that um, the high level of heterogeneity, heterogeneity that this uh, technology has. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francesco. For the sake of time, because uh, I also would like to hear oh. the concluding remarks, I think we have seven minutes uh, before finishing. I see Tawid wants to intervene. So what I, what I wanted is that each of you could give us like a, a one minute uh, uh, tweet or concluding sentence. And so I'll start with Ta Tawid. Before I do that, let's just, just say that you addressed all the questions. There were three additional all linked to the issue of climate change. There is, a, the, of course, there is a question about what do we do and what are the implications for value chains for developing countries in the face of the changing policies, especially of advanced countries to tackle climate change. And there were a couple of very nice comments. Thanks about UNCTAD work on climate change, green recovery and trade, and overall on, uh, on the importance of, of climate change uh, as one of the issues uh, the, the industrial organization should be looking at. So let us let me say one minute, Tawid, whatever you wanted to say, plus your concluding statement, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go with uh, a casual order. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to add about the free trade agreement. Uh, we know that uh, free trade agreement have advantage because market access for country export that will be more open. But I think uh, if, uh, free trade agreement not only to increase the market, but, uh, but uh, to force solve the problem. In this pandemic, the agreement that occur with FTA need to consider with this issue like NPMs or climate change, 
I think that's one uh, issue we have to solve with this uh, FTA, not only about the tariff, but the tariff is also important. The second one, yeah, I think we have to uh, uh, considering about the international forum that maybe uh, one country more offer protection uh, to, uh, to, uh, to some kind of product and will reduce GVC partition globally in the long term. I think it's one issue because uh, in this situation, a uh, lot of country, maybe some of them uh, protect their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their export to other countries that we need it. I think that's, that's the, the important that I think how, 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 how trade bear is created during a pandemic will be different than so we have to solve this in the certain time. Thank you. Thank you, Tawid. Uh, then let's say we, we could do, if you agree, Adnan, uh, Francesco, and then Fiona to conclude. Adnan? Okay, thank you very much. I'll try to stick to one minute. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, maybe trying to kind of summarize a bit what I try to convene here uh, and also uh, provide an indication on opportunities for developing countries in particular, because I was not speaking too much about that. I think that the, the key takeaway for me is that um, the problem today in the context of GVCs is, is that they operate on a model that is that was relevant, say, 15 to 20 years ago. Okay, So back in the days, if you think about purchasing managers at multinational enterprises, um, they had one metric, and that was cost, basically. So if something costs 1% less uh, elsewhere, you go for it. Okay, but today we live in a world that uh, is changing very rapidly. Right? So we discussed the factors of productions which have been changing, climate is changing, etc. So things are becoming way more um, complex. And I think the conclusion is in going forward that the GVC model uh, of the future will be explicitly taking into consideration disruption and diversification, which is brought about by uh, the, the, the mega trends. And I think what is likely to come out of it, and we observed it already in certain industries, in certain multinational firms, is that similar to what happened after the financial crisis, when the banks started, you know, or were mandated to stress test, uh, I think a lot of companies will start stress testing their supply chains. And this will likely result in a scenario where multinational firms, the lead firms, rethink where and how they invest uh, with the view of increasing, of course, resilience and gaining market um, access. And that may even come at the expense of short-term short efficiency. Now, why I'm saying that, I, th I think it, I'm saying that because that is that sort of window of opportunity for developing countries, potentially, um, because we see this increasing move towards dual sourcing or um, multi-sourcing strategies uh, that are being uh, de deployed, where firms have different suppliers in different uh, regions. And this should open up opportunities also for developing countries. However, I still believe that geography matters and will continue to matter. So if you are very far away, if you are small and not integrated, you are not likely to benefit. If you are close to the core markets, if you are open, you are likely to benefit from things like nearshoring, et cetera. So my key takeaway here is that moving forward, um, developing countries in particular have to rethink the whole concept of competitive advantage um, as, as labor cost advantage per se is no longer sufficient to guarantee participation and benefiting from GVCs. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Adnan. Francesco, and then Fiona. Okay, uh, very briefly, uh, three points to summarize what I say. First, understanding today the potential of the 4 year is an imperative for developing countries in order to avoid growing marginalization tomorrow. Second, uh, development strategy should focus uh, less on international economic integration. Uh, I agree with, with Anna, we need to rethink uh, comparative advantages 
and uh, considerably more on what we, we, I called uh, regional integration. Uh, the last one, uh, I mean, the continental free trade area could play an important role in the reconfiguration of GVC and could be uh, really important uh, uh, for uh, the Africa's future if we take into consideration the, the problem that uh, we know free trade area can, uh, can have for small economies. Thank you. Fiona? Yes, well, uh, very quickly. Firstly, just to, uh, to pick up on uh, what the colleagues have said about the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement, um, we haven't talked uh, much today about regional value chains, but of course, regional value chains are, are reality and play a very important role, uh, well, in this case, in, in, in Africa, but uh, obviously more broadly. And I think one of the hopes from the, um, the free trade agreement is that it will also open the space uh, for strengthening um, existing regional value chains um, and perhaps um, even uh, in encouraging uh, new ones. Um, and thereby strengthening uh, those links as a part of a, a regional integration um, and industrialization uh, thrust within the continent. Um, and secondly, and, and lastly, really just to underscore that uh, I think broadly on the, on the topic of, of, of GBCs, we, we need a nuanced approach that emphasizes uh, the contingency of outcomes, that outcomes are, are, are contingent, um, of course, not only on policy, but at least in, in part on, on uh, policy choices. So firms in, in uh, developing countries um, can get squeezed out from GVCs altogether, or they can get the, uh, the benefits of, of GVCs for them squeezed, um, or they can actually maneuver to get a bit more space um, and a bit more of, of, the, of the benefits uh, for industrialization um, and, and for growth. Um, and so it's, it's not only about uh, GVC policy, obviously there's a policy, policies which are needed specifically for GVCs, but I think perhaps more fundamentally than what we might call a GVC policy um, is policies in other areas, uh, uh, including traditional industrial policy tools that create uh, the basis for maximizing those advantages uh, for, from GVCs. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, I've been interacting quite a lot, and so I don't think it's uh, you. You all made a great, uh, a great summary of the discussion. I just want to thank you again all for for being with us and for debating and uh, thanking uh, thanking Paper for for crafting this and for uh, bringing ideas that we can bring in the policy dialogue. I, my my just uh, concluding say would say. You know, the, the situation and the pandemic probably accelerated trends. It exposed uh, increasingly more the need uh, to support developing countries' uh, industrialization, really, because it's good for each country, but it's also good for the world. We need more capabilities anywhere because we, we do need a, a future that is, is really prosperous for all. And what I would say is that you're telling us Okay, it's difficult, but it was never difficult. And I think that we were, it was never easy. So it's possible with strategies, with policies, and with crafted negotiations, it is possible to, to scale up and industrialize. And there is value in development strategies and in updating them to work in the context. So national, regional, and continental, we probably need it all. Pier Giuseppe, to you to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annalisa, and thank you too all the panelists of today, as you said, a stellar panel for such an enlightening and very vivid discussion. I really hope that this just represents one additional step in our cooperation because more cooperation between international organizations, between international organizations and policymakers and academia and civil society is precisely what we need to address the rising demand of policy advice or policy analysis, which is coming not only from developing countries, as Adam was suggesting before, uh, these mega trends are affecting developing countries, developed countries, emerging countries. So there is a rising demand for policy analysis and here we are and our cooperation can help in this direction. Uh, just to conclude, just three very quick points, just each wing of what you have said during this discussion, which I think are important take home. The first one is the primacy of structural transformation and diversification as a policy objective. So global value chain participation, trade, shall be looked at as instruments rather than aim. The aim of the policy should be always be the structural transformation and diversification, which can take place within the manufacturing sector to our upgrading, which can take place looking at other sectors, digital economy, the creative economy, the services that Francesco was suggesting. Now, 
One important instrument in this case, and I completely agree with, with Fiona, is regional value chain, is regional integration. It's part of the work that we're uh, do, doing together also with Annalisa and the OECD Development Center. And, 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 and again, Adam was, was stressing this, the mega trends are pushing us in this direction. Now we are shortening the value chain. We're looking much more at sourcing within the region. So we need to look at that. There is a window of opportunity that was emphasized in the case of Asia by Tawid, in the case of Africa by Francesco, emphasizing also the potential rule that uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can have, can have in this direction. And in this part of the work that they've been doing at ANCTAD, the regional uh, integration and the regional agreement can be used to, for example, build up digital infrastructure, which are one of the key points which has been mentioned today. And we also called the recently attempted for the regional pact in different uh, regions of the South on medical equipment and in terms of medical research, which becomes particularly important in this conjunction. The third and the last point I want to make is the one on the importance of the state. The role of the state has been somehow rediscovered in this emergency and is, of course, a very welcome news. Industrial policy, as Adnan was saying, is becoming fashionable. We have to use this window of opportunity, in a sense, to use more and more policy to push firms to internalize spillovers and externality, to activate those linkages, which Fiona was referring to, and to identify opportunity for the company. We need more regulation in this direction to create this incentive, and we need more active industrial policy, which is uh, absolutely important. Again, as Annalisa was saying, this is somehow easier. We discussed this with Celeste a few days ago with Celeste Drake from the Made in America at the office of the White House. It's somehow easier for advanced economy. We need to work in the international arena, in multilateral uh, kind of uh, uh, meeting and possibility to stress the importance of increasing the policy space uh, for developing countries. I guess that I think that our ministerial meeting in Barbados, the forthcoming meeting of the WTO, are important opportunities to move in this direction. And I really hope that all the discussion that we have today, all the conversation that we have done, can resonate uh, during our ministerial and in other important ministerial meetings. Uh, that said, I thank you once again, all of you, for uh, animating the discussion, even through chat and question, and to all the participants. And uh, nothing more to add. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Atman. Thank you. Francesco. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All the best.